everyone. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mary Jane Burke. I'm happy to welcome uh, you to this um, call. I uh, want to be sure that you have a good sense of who's on the call. We have invited specifically school leaders um, and from our public, private, independent, and parochial schools who may be thinking about uh, the possibility of applying for a waiver. So just to have a sense of that, this um, session will in fact be recorded, so we'll be able to uh, share with others. Um, you'll be, it'll be posted uh, by later this afternoon or the, at the latest tomorrow morning. Um, and we're going to go through um, several um, pieces of information. I do, though, want to begin by managing expectations. So could I move to the first slide, please? So the first, oh, first slide. Um, welcome to Dr. Santor um, and Dr. Willis. Thank you very much, as always, for, for supporting. So just to give you a little bit of background, um, and I think I actually want to start on March 13th, and many of you will know that to be Friday the 13th, uh, the day that we found out that our schools would not be available for students in person beginning that next Monday, the 16th. On June 18th, uh, there was um, information provided to all of our schools, public, private, and independent, a 30-point plan of the steps that would be necessary to consider um, students returning to our classroom. I want you to know that that document is currently under review to ensure that any new state gu guidelines that are have been um, provided have been integrated into the document. We anticipate it will be available for you by our session next Wednesday, um, August 12th at nine o'clock. So that's something that'll be coming up. An example would be um, that we were looking at uh, masks our face coverings for students beginning in grade three originally, um, and the public health uh, guidance moved that to, um, I mean, we, we had a TK through um, adults and the public health guidance moved it to third grade with our commitment that we would be working with young children in TK up to grade uh, three uh, to ensure that they would get practice and be uh, provided instruction on how to wear their masks. So that was June 18th. Um, and on July 15th, uh, Dr. Willis issued information to all of us based on the data locally, as well as, um, I guess he'll be able to tell us, but many, many different factors and let us know that he would not um, want any of us to have full students in person anytime before September 8th, and uh, that is the Monday after the Labor Day weekend. So then, uh, that was July 15th, then what happened next? On the next slide, uh, you're aware that on the 17th, Governor Newsom announced a statewide guidance and that essentially provided um, information for all of us, private, public, independent uh, schools, that um, if you were on the state monitor list or the watch list, um, that you would not be able to uh, return to school until 14 days, consecutive days being off that watch list. And as a reminder, Marin County was in fact placed on the watch list in early July. Um, and there are many, many others in our state, I think over 30 who are also on that watch list. Um, and then the next step was that uh, we began to provide additional um, information to um, our community to identify the steps that would be necessary once we had information about the watch list, but also on the 17th. And the reason for this session, session in particular, which is on the next slide, is that we, we find ourselves um, uh, being able to um, ask for a waiver. And uh, the state said that there would be very specific criteria. The wording here on this slide, which will also be provided to all of you, is information that is taken, you know, exactly from the uh, the state the state guidance, but essentially would give our public health officer an opportunity to provide a waiver um, if we can meet a particular. Um, Oh, shall we say guidelines that would be necessary. So I want you to know here that we actually made a decision here um, to act, give you the information that we have 
um, even though we know we do not have all the all the answers to questions at this point, and we thought it was better to let you know what we do know. And so today's session is not going to be able to answer all of the questions, but would hopefully be able to um, have you begin thinking about what will be necessary to provide uh, to look to a waiver to reopen um, your schools if they are serving a TK through grade six. And so with that, um, this next slide is um, telling us what happened on um, August 3rd. And, you know, we received a press release. We sent it out to all of you that provided um, more information about the waiver, what it would need to look like. Uh, the state provided a template. Um, and then on August 4th, we forwarded a press release that you also did receive um, that gives more information about the steps we would be looking to take here in our county. So with that background, this next slide um, is a really a very important one. On, I'm going to move this to Dr. Willis, but um, I think we all know as we have approached this pandemic, uh, the importance of ensuring that all students in our community have equitable access to safe, secure, um, learning environments with appropriate technology and so on. And I think most not, I'm sure most of us are well aware of what's happening in our uh, community right now related to the development of pods, et cetera. So Dr. Willis, I'll pass this to you. Thank you, Mary Jane. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, our goal here um, is really just to, you know, begin this dialogue on, um, how we're going to, I mean, obviously the, the broader framing is how do we, how do we get children back into school um, this year with, with COVID-19 among us? Um, and, and how do we do that in ways where we're balancing um, the risks of infection with we know, what we know to be the harms of um, non-classroom based learning? Uh, we, you know, we learned a lot about um, both of those things um, over the past few months, you know, learned um, we closed schools. Marin County was one of the first counties to, to close when we were seeing surges in cases, learned that the, the distance learning um, that then occurred was um, suboptimal uh, and negative you know, for many, uh, and that that experience was inequitably distributed. There was a disproportionate number of children of low income that felt even further behind in that model and just want to acknowledge that one of our organizing principles as we move forward, if we really want to take an honest look at what, how, how should we approach this societally in a year where uh, school environments are going to be different is, is how do we do this in a way that doesn't further magnify existing social inequities. Um, and uh, there are no great models um, for an for that yet, and we need to be innovative and creative in how we solve that problem, particularly in Marin County, which is um, a remarkable um, laboratory, if you will, of, uh, of, of um, affluence as well as, as poverty, and, um, and, and really think offers all of us a chance to, to design strategies that, that close that gap as much as possible, and I assume that's a value that we all share. And so I just wanted to sort of surface that as one of the one of the lenses that we're going to be using to um, to approach questions around um, organizing um, the the learning environment. Um, and I don't want to cut just the school environment because it's a lot of this is going to happen outside of schools. Um, for the for you know, <coughs> excuse me, coming. <coughs> I just had my <coughs> Lisa. <laughs> I'm going to hand it off to Lee. <laughs> follow there is again we we see that learning will happen outside of schools for many and our goal again is to ensure that all in Marin um, regardless of your income your color can have supportive learning environments and that is where we're going to be seeking partnership with this group even as we develop the waiver process that you as schools that are pursuing a waiver are considering how are you applying the racial equity lens in your plans and ensuring access for um, all in Marin. And that, is, um, and that is a conversation that will be evolving in the weeks to come. Great, thank you. And I think my voice is coming back. 
it's eating on the fly. <laughs> um, so this is, yeah, and so that, that's some sort of broad, broad framing, but we, you know, we want to have, the, this is also just a practical conversation for you as, as you um, consider, you know, we're assuming that you know, most of you on this call are, are here because you're, you're interested in the waiver application process, maybe considering submitting a, a, way, you know, a waiver application um, we've actually received some applications and um, want to be clear that no applications yet that have been submitted thus far will be considered. Um, unfortunately, you know, we, we, um, we're not able to review applications that are not in a standardized format so we can see them um, in, a, in a fair way across all the applications where they include all the elements that we, that we want. So we will be um, refining the application itself over the next week um, and, and offering you um, the final product for you to fill out if you're, in, if you're planning to submit a waiver application by the end of next week. This conversation is to, is to, to tee that up and to uh, give, you, you know, give, give you a sense of what we are going to include as the requirements for the application um, and then answer some of the questions you may have that would help guide your, your application process. To flag the timing that we're seeing now as, as you know, for this is that um, we will finalize the waiver application next week. We will send it out by the end of next week. Um, the, uh, you will have a week to fill out the, the application, the earliest that um, applications received by the 21st, which is a Friday, would allow us that two week interval um, to make a decision about whether schools can open. Um, and as, already, as we already indicated, um, and based on our numbers, the earliest that any school would resume classroom-based learning in Marin County would be September 8th, which is the Tuesday following Memorial Day, Monday the 7th. And that's, um, again, that shouldn't come as a surprise because that was the, that was the announcement that we made in, in June when we started seeing increased numbers of cases um, and knew that we needed to delay what had been the assumption of a, a classroom-based experience starting in mid-August. Um, and that's been important. You know, we, we've seen our numbers remain um, close to 200. So I'm just gonna give you a little bit of a summary of some of the data that you should be looking to to, to know how we'll be navigating these decisions. The state has set a, set a, a metric of 100 cases per 100,000 residents Every, over 14 days, so cumulatively over 14 days. For Marin County, that corresponds to about 19 new cases a day. Um, so if we're above averaging 19 new cases per day, it means we're going to be above that threshold and we will be on the monitoring list. Um, right now, our case counts are closer to 200 per 100,000 per 14 days. So we're close to that number of being twice the number that would get us on the monitoring list. The governor has signaled that that number of 200 is actually an indication that the health officer no longer at that level no longer has the authority to offer through a waiver permission for any school to open to classroom-based learning. In other words, the, the state has indicated that no schools will be open to classroom-based learning in any community that has an incidence of greater than 200 per 100,000 residents in the past 14 days. So our, and we are right now at about 180 um, and there's also, you may have seen in the news, um, some concerns about undercounting um, related to the state database that collects cases and reports them. We are, we are partly reliant upon the state. We have our own reporting procedures with our laboratories and we're confident that our numbers are, are, are accurate, but there's a, there's a question mark that's important to acknowledge this week over the reliability of the numbers that we're receiving. So, it, it is 180, that is a, that is a, a, a minimum because it's, it's likely there might be some degree of undercounting based on the state data problem. So that should offer some context for why we are at the earliest looking at um, September 8th. And it also gives us time um, to, you know, to clarify the, the waiver application process and give you time to fill out the waivers and for us to consider them. Can I have the next slide, please? So these are, we're just gonna go quickly through the, the, the elements of the waiver application one by one. I'll take a few and then Dr. Santor will take some. 
So the first element that will be considered, obviously you'll be, you'll be providing all the information about your school. Um, uh, and, then, and then we'll need to answer some, some basic questions. Um, and that what the first is that the Marin Public Health Guidance that we published on June 18th and then um, revised version will be um, issued tomorrow, um, August 7th. Um, is that tomorrow? Yes. Um, the, um, have been implemented and are detailed in the school uh, site-specific pr protection plan. So through the Marin Recovers, um, all of you should have the school site-specific protection plan um, and that we have we have issued the um, through Marin County Office of Education um, last month a 30, 30 point um, standards of safe resuming schools and it, it outlines a variety of different interventions and measures that we think are necessary to be in place, including things like you know screening employees, disinfection practices, moving things outdoors where you can, some of the testing expectations, et cetera, are contained in that document. So the first element is that that there needs to be a verification that those are in your site specific protection plan and that plan is um, submitted with the application um, when you when you apply as an attachment. Oh, here we go. So that's, two. so I combined one and two, didn't I? Okay. Do you want to just go to number two real quick, just so that we're clear on that? Thank you. So there you go. So I, and, it, and that's the site specific pr protection plan. It needs to be published and posted on the school website and included as attachment in the application. Next, please. Um, Importantly, this, you know, the state requires this um, and, it, and it, it, is, it is an expectation that a school's decision to return to classroom based learning is based on consensus of the key partners in that community. Um, and that includes parents, community organizations and labor. Um, and this, the, the application before, you know, we don't want to see an application that doesn't reflect that consensus um, because it, uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's a non-starter in some ways um, if it doesn't, if the, if the permission isn't built into the community that would be a, a seeking to open the school. Um, so if the, if the school doesn't have a labor organization, the school has to consult, consult with school site staff. So that's relevant for some of the private schools especially. Next. The other, um, Factor, and I think this is this is going to be, you know, a growth area for for those of you who, for whom the the testing space is new. But we are going to require that schools who apply for waivers have a plan for testing for COVID nineteen, um, and that's because um, we know that this is key to maintaining a safe school environment when we know the virus is is in our in the community. Um, we are seeing cases and will see cases occasionally in, in school settings. The way to make sure that this setting is as safe as possible is to make sure that the staff are tested on a regular basis as essential workers. Um, and our recommendation, our requirement is that the, 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 the staff are tested monthly. Um, the best way to do that is for half of the staff to be tested every two weeks rather than everyone on a monthly basis, but actually a rotating. Um, some are doing you know, quarter of the staff every week we thought offering it as half of staff every two weeks gives you a little more freedom. Um, and there needs to be a verified plan for that. We also expect that schools that open um, through a waiver take responsibility for the testing associated with school-based COVID-19 cases, including exposures or outbreaks. And, the, and in that setting, there would be a conversation with with our team, Marin County Public Health, to determine what this testing strategy should be associated with that situation. Um, but that the, the testing responsibility would be placed upon the school in a relationship with a vendor who provides testing and there are a variety of vendors like this. And this is partly because, you know, testing remains a limited resource. Um, we are focusing our testing in um, certain high vulnerability settings, skilled nursing facilities and low income communities. Um, and that the, you know the we see this as part of of well-being and health for you as as leaders in school uh, in the school environment to recognize that this year uh, that includes taking responsibility for COVID-19 testing. Um, 
and we need to see who that vendor is as part of the application. And we can help with that. We can help sort of you know help you see who the vendors are and what the what the processes and procedures are. And then I'll hand it off to Dr. Santora to handle the, the next few elements of the application. Hi, right. and um, just to add on to that part of testing, what we will be looking at with public schools is how can we, as public health, provide support for a testing plan, where this may be again the first area where we prioritize based um, testing based on racial equity, uh, our, our lens of racial equity and having an equity centered practice with our, our public health testing resources. And this will continue to be a challenge. Uh, we have seen limitations in testing available um, through healthcare providers and laboratories. And so this is an area that we will continue to work with, um, work with one providing, helping to identify resources for private, parochial and independent schools, and then working with public schools to develop plans for testing. But again, this is a limited resource, which is why there will be prioritization in our, in, in our process. And that also um, leads into what happens when we do test positive, have tests that are positive. It's critical for us to be able to provide a rapid response from Marin County Public Health is to be able to know who in your school is identified as our lead, our lead COVID-19 contact. And we will be providing training and um, support to those individuals to make sure that they understand their roles. For example, making sure, ensuring that we have strong attendance and roster practices, learning how to develop a line list. Um, so when we do identify who is in a cohort and then working together to provide uh, recommendations if there is a known exposure and we've discussed those that previously. And then before I move on, I remember the other point I was thinking is that this, and this is something I always have to remind myself that in framing, this waiver, as Dr. Willis mentioned, is about is when we are in our watch list status. So just be prepared that there will be an evolution in our recommendations for testing as we get off of the county watch list and um, as, the, as this disease evolves in our community. But also, again, to be prepared, and this is something I, I constantly remind myself is that three months from now, we could be prepared to see another surge. Um, we, we've seen that in Australia now. And so I think that's what we have to be prepared for, where this ebb and flow of COVID in our community as we learn how it behaves. We can jump to the next slide. And again, this is just for providing an understanding for us. This is an opportunity um, for some, for creative writing and uh, for you to describe why, um, why a waiver is, um, makes is a good fit for your school, how your, your community, your school community is ready to support this waiver um, application. And again, this just reemphasizes in the italics below the area that we are, the areas we are prioritizing. And again, we really want to be driven by a racial equity lens. We have already seen the educational attainment gap widen in our community just with three months of disparities in the learning environments that uh, students in our community had. And so that's a priority. Dr. Willis has emphasized since the beginning of really looking at schools that are looking outside of the box towards outdoor activities. This is where we are safest is when we are outside. So there's a tremendous opportunity for us to maximize outdoor settings and to think of our school campuses differently to, again, optimize time students and staff and teachers spend outside where there's a significantly lower risk, especially before we get into the, the hotter times of our, our years. Um, and, Essentially, wildfire smoke filled days. So there's an opportunity really to maximize outdoor activities. And again, focusing on early adopters. And I just want to highlight this point. We have had very successful pilots in um, childcare um, and youth activities in camps where we are, are providing safe environments for students. And we believe that those, those schools that have um, been early adopters of some of our health and safety protocols by having pilots throughout the summer have demonstrated success and are more prepared um, for, from a staffing perspective and a, a community perspective to implement the site safety um, plan. So jump to number seven. And so we partner with MCOE to create a, an email. Thank you, team MCOE. And this is the email where you'll be submitting, where you will be submitting your waiver application. And again, we will need time just to review the applications. We're trying to standardize it and make it as streamlined as possible on our side so there are no delays. But again, aiming for that September 8th start date. So this is the Triple S Double P, uh, our school site specific protection plan. 
Um, these templates will be distributed. Again, there's opportunities for you to see what's in place already on our Marine Recover websites. We want to see that you're integrating. Um, there will be some changes um, in the guidelines that we'll be distributing as soon as possible, but that you've integrated the guide, guidelines we've developed into your school operations. There's also great resources available on Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The CDC site last um, month has finally amplified the supports it's providing and more specificity on how to um, create a healthy and safe, a healthier and safer school environment. So encouraging that to look to that as a resource, but we'll be distributing this template. And again, we'll also be looking at posting these templates for the community to see. We see waiver schools will be um, early adopters and early leaders in creating healthier and safer environments and want to be able to uh, demonstrate to the community um, just our transparency and how, how these waivers are being successful and, um, and moving the community forward towards in-classroom instru instruction for all in Marin. And there you go, these are our our numbers will also be sharing our own. We've developed a school specific COVID email that we'll, we'll be sharing as we move forward with our training and support for your staff. We met with the Marin School Nurses Organization yesterday and we'll be having a healthcare meeting later this month with um, healthcare providers and nurse school nurses in order to try and find those seamless strategies um, as students and staff return to school. When we do have those events and there will be them, um, when children present with a fever, when children need to get tested, how can we ensure that we have considered together with the healthcare community at large all of the implications, for example, clearance to return to school and other things. So again, we, we appreciate your patience as we are evolving our approach and refining our approach as we learn more. And, uh, and again, we look forward to continuing this partnership. Okay, um, are we ready to start trying to address some of the questions? Itoko Garcia, do you wanna go ahead and start? While Itoko's, while Itoko's un unmuting, um, one other th piece of context is that we're, we're working, you know, closely with the state, you know, the, the state guidance, I think the waiver application template was made available 48 hours ago. Um, and we've been working on revising that. Um, and then regional health officers are also um, you know, seeking to align so that the practices in Marin are not so different than the practices in our neighboring counties. Um, and that's another piece of what, uh, what will be kind of in, in the forefront of our work uh, over the next few days to ensure that the, that the process that we define for you by the end of next week um, is, is, is aligned with obviously what the state expects, but also with what's the, what our normal normative process is regionally. Thank you. Uh, and thank you all for putting on this presentation. It's really helpful. Um, I'm excited to get, get to work on our waiver. I, I just, I, I may have missed it and I apologize if I did, but just to clarify, we're, we're only talking about K-6. There's absolutely no waiver. There's no way we'll consider opening seventh and eighth grade, correct? Yeah, right. Sorry, that's 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 an important piece of framing, um, not to gloss over. So yes, this is K through six. You know, the state sees elementary as K through six. You know, we organize six, seven, eight as, as, as middle school as part of secondary. So, um, the, and, and the state has indicated that any, any any county that's on the monitoring list cannot open um, secondary education as they define it as, as seven through twelve. So um, this is all. This whole conversation is about K through six and sixth grade. You know, so six sixth grades that are in, in schools where it's six, seven, eight. Um, there's an you know an opportunity there for that to be the only you know to be the only students on that campus. Or, or, or take, take advantage of that architectural resource um, of, of otherwise empty classrooms for other purposes such as learning hubs. Um, Andrew Davis, do you wanna go ahead? And then Ken, if you could, I can't see the questions that people have posted, so I'll ask I can help with that. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, thank you for taking my question and thank you for everything that you guys are doing. Uh, my question is, 
Can we submit multiple applications simultaneously? We want to prioritize our K and one students on campus, and we could manage to do that entirely outdoors. But we'd also love to have our second to fifth grade students on site, though that would require more indoor use. Does it make sense to submit both simultaneously? Yeah, and is your question, um, is your question that you would submit to two different applications or, or to have so, a single application? Correct. One for K-1 entirely outdoors and one for K-5 of a blend of indoors outdoors. I would recommend one application and yeah. if you're planning a phase approach just to describe that in your yeah. narrative. Yeah, um, thank you. I, yeah exactly. One application per school. Great, thanks. Yeah. And I would just say where if other schools are considering the same, um, to be as clear in the narrative about the strategy that differs from one to the to the other. Thank you. So that we could because the, because the implication there is there may be a um, you know a specific allowance um, for one piece and not another or a delay on another. And we we, we would um, we would assume. Thanks for that question because I, I can clarify. I think that what we would assume is that we would be able to offer an answer that would differentiate. If, if there was a different answer to different pieces that we would be able to offer permission for one and per, per, potentially not for the other, or at least a delay on the other, if that makes sense. Okay, so maybe we can move to some of the questions that were in the chat. Um, we've had a number of them in a couple of different areas. These all relate to the waiver. I've been open since June 1st. We've been doing great. Do I need a waiver? We would need to, I think we need to know more about that environment in terms of what, what quote, being open from June 1st, end quote, means. Um, and in terms of whether or not that's a, that's a violation um, that uh, had been under the radar and therefore would not be allowed to, <laughs> mm -hmm. to, uh, to or, or whether or not it's, it's, it was one of the strategies that was endorsed as a pilot. Um, we're not, we're not planning to, um, not allow anything that has previously been allowed um, under the under the provisions of the what we were doing under the shelter in place, including our learning pilots, our stable cohorts of twelve, some of the um, special ed classrooms. Those are those are moving forward as they had, um, but certainly if there's other activity, um, just having having done it historically does not offer permission to do it in the future. There are a number of questions, and this may be something that can't be answered definitively right now, because I know we know that these are still things being worked out, but the idea of consulting, can we say more about what consultation means in practice? Is it permission, or would we need surveys? What type of um, consultation needs to be provided? Lisa, do you want to take that? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the loaded one. Um, I think what we want to see, we do not want to be in a position as public health to be in between um, opposing parties, honestly. And we want there to be um, one, we want to be, know that staff are ready, willing, and able to return to work and um, not that we're, we, again, that we would, we or the Office of Education would be put, put in the middle. So. I think you know there there needs to be support from from labor that they're going to return to school as a pilot, and I think that's you know as a part of this waiver process in order to avoid um, unnecessary um, contention between the school's decision. And I think honestly, it's just it's going to be driven by this, the availability of staff, and we want to we want to be engaged with ready and willing and able partners so we can focus our efforts on providing from a public health perspective, infection prevention and control supports and guidance and other things that we will be offering on a school by school basis. So that's when, when I hear consultation, it's that um, that we, we wanna know that there is a, a readiness, willingness and an ability to staff the schools as being um, proposed. And that I think that that is, an, that is navigating a tricky spot with, with where, where labor is right now for some from for certain for some school districts is that is that just so i'm clear on the context there's i think consultation there's consultation with public health in response 
you know, that language appears there, I think, and then it also appears in the expectation that they waiver application and include demonstration of consultation with uh, labor and parents and community members. Do you know which, is it both? Or which, which was that question pointed at? The qu there have been a few under that topic um, and they have been, I think, more related to consultation with labor and with community organizations and asking what that would look like as well. Assuming that would be um, community organizations that provide significant services at the schools, that kind of thing. That's the, those are the questions related to those two items. Yeah, I mean, I think um, this is also something we'll define more specifically with with the Office of Education and and with the school districts um, and 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 school boards. You know, the as 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 uh, Dr. Santora mentioned, the intent is to reflect you know consensus of those um, stakeholders who stand to benefit or harm or or be harmed by whatever strategy is, 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 is adopted. Um, there's, there needs to be a, an endorsement. I think Mary Jane, the, can you just correct me, the, the way it's framed in the application is that there's an attestation that that has occurred. Right, right. Um, you're right, the, that the, the person who would be applying and that would always be the superintendent or the head of school, right? Those are the, the they're specifically named out in the guidance. Um, from the state template and um, the way this is set up is they would attest that they have consulted um, and it, it would say, for example, CSEA on what date, right? So that's the way this is set up um, currently. Next question is, do we need to use the school site safety plan template or can we use our own? Can I answer that, Matt? Yes. We want to use, have everyone use the school site safety plan that's been issued. That yes. now, what well, that will, if you, if you look at that, that will hit every single point um, that was in the original 30 point plan, also in the template that's been re recently provided on August 4th. So you will ensure that you've been able to cover all of the points. And if you've developed a plan, you know, if you, if you developed a plan already, um, then, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that it would be a lot of cutting and pasting into the school site protection plan mm -hmm. um, because yeah. the elements, the principles and the elements of safety are the, are the same and they're not complex. I mean, yeah. so I, I, the behavior, the operationalization is complex, but the elements themselves are not complex to describe. So hopefully mm -hmm. it won't be too much of a lift for you to mm -hmm. stick it into that template. And that this has been set up or will be available to everyone in a fillable form. Great. Can you please confirm that preschool programs run on school district campuses are not required to submit a waiver since they fall under preschool guidelines? That is correct. Okay. For sixth grade, um, would homerooms, are you focused on homeroom style self-contained settings or would departmentalized structures more like a secondary school be considered? Yeah, we're, we're looking at the guidance to be um, elementary school. So good question. Um, the, it, right now we're referring to our guidance, our 30 point recommendations, which um, offer a configuration of stable cohorts of children in elementary school that corresponds to the essentially the size of the uh, you know conventional classroom size and then for sec for secondary education we indicated that cohorts could be larger um, where you might have multiple classrooms but should still be the de smaller defined groups um, for the purposes of the waiver application we're going to consider sixth grade to be elementary school um, so that there's not a there's not a one grade difference um, in in how we're approaching this. So, um, and we can clarify that, um, and we need to make sure that we do clarify that in 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 our revisions of that of the requirements. So that what that means is that for sixth grade, it would be a stable cohort, um, according to the conventional classroom size for that setting, um, and um, and as, as is described for elementary schools in the existing guidelines. 
There are a number of questions about testing. I think we can sum a lot of them up by just asking, are you able to give an update on testing availability in general? We've had staff attempt to get tested and they've had to leave the county to do so. Also, will our local health care providers be offering more testing and quicker testing results? I can take that. So testing is not widely available for surveillance-based testing as we're describing. Um, we are seeing a resource um, prioritization and we're seeing at, um, for example, at Kaiser where there's, um, they have a true prioritization scheme and surveillance testing of essential workers is not, is not part of that current prioritization due to testing availability, which is why we as a county already move forward with looking to an outside contract we know some private schools have also sought outside laboratory contracts, just like with our nursing homes. And that will be resources that we make available as local resources that um, schools can look to. And again, we'll be looking inward within public health about how to reallocate our testing resources in order to assure access for um, public school staff that are in, in a waiver, um, that have been approved for a waiver for this testing. And that also might be as we, look at our testing resources, that may be part of our determination in, in allowing a certain number of waivers for approval because of the availability of testing resources. And again, just the caveat that, that this, could, this would change as we see us um, hopefully begin shifting downward and off that watch list that the, the increase the testing um, that's necessary for, uh, for schools once we're off, off of the waiver. But it's going to be something that we'll be developing resources to share and then we'll have to be looking at our current resources to maintain that what we are setting for ourselves as a standard for access to testing. But looking to your healthcare providers will is not the 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 path that will yield um, the best outcomes at this point because they have very limited resources and are prioritizing that for symptomatic patients at this point. Yeah, let me just add that the testing, the testing landscape is changing a lot. I mean, there's obviously a lot of entrepreneurial, um, you know, it, it, this is something that is purchasable um, and, uh, and as such, you know, is, is yielding a lot of business, um, business opportunities for, for laboratories. And so we're seeing more, um, more and more um, companies coming online who are offering, you know, high performance, rapid turnaround testing. We, we took advantage of that as a county contracting with Color Genomics, 300 tests a day near the Civic Center, paid for by the county. Um, and it's been great. I mean, they, they're, they're, they're turning around, you know, 24 to, 40, 24 to 36 hours. Um, and that's it, you know, that's, a, that's a, um, an example of, and that just was two weeks ago. And when we were looking at Color, there were other other companies. Um, so I think the, you know, I would encourage school communities, um, especially since it's required in the waiver to, um, to enter and, you know, not, not necessarily see the existing testing landscape and the constraints there as the environment that you're entering, but rather seeking to acquire an additional resource that would be funded through the school. Mm -hmm. um, Sorry, Ken, can, can I just, can I just yes. jump in for one second? Uh, Dr. Willis, could you describe, um, I'm an employee and I don't want to be tested. Can you describe sort of what the reaction to that would be um, and when there would be a requirement to do so? Yeah, I mean, I think the first, the first approach would be, you know, um, you know, education and just sort of reassurance um, as to what the value of testing is, how it um, is important for, you know, for personal health and for the health of, of those around you and for the environment. Um, the expectation that that is a matter of um, community welfare and well-being and social responsibility. Um, and then uh, if still the answer is no, then, um, you know, then that's, you know, unfortunate, but that would be someone who would be sort of a, remain a wild card in that environment. Um, that would change if there was a case. So if there was a, you know, if there was an outbreak on campus, um, the, the way we address that is to test to test everyone. This is how we address outbreaks in skilled nursing facilities, prison, whatever it is, you test. Um, and then, because people have been exposed, you know people have been exposed, but you don't know who, who among those who have been exposed is, has been infected and is infectious to others. Um, and so the risk there is sufficiently high that we would require that individuals who had known exposures um, 
either demonstrate that they've had a test um, and that they're negative or that they're not, they're not, they're, they're excluded from that environment. Okay. And I just want to, this is an area where we, our protocol for testing is really erring on, on, on the true side of caution. This is one of our strategies around containment where what we're seeing in the current camps and youth activities and uh, pilot classrooms is that we're not seeing uh, transmission within the, within the cohort because they're maintaining physical distance, they are wearing their face coverings, and so we're not seeing that level of transmission. But again, to move us toward um, full in-classroom instruction and to provide the reassurance that the school community needs to be productive in the day and to create a healthy, safe, and productive learning environment, this is the tool that we'll be using now um, more, more bluntly than we would as we evolve in our relationship with COVID-19. Ken, back to you, sorry. Yeah, Ken, you're muted. Sorry. Um, the, the, the other question related to testing is for uh, non-public schools or programs that support families that live in um, underserved communities or have economic challenges. Is there any help on the horizon for testing program for um, schools that may be in that position? Um, yes, I mean, I think we would, I think we would approach, you know, any, any school um, with the with the goal of, of helping them acquire the testing resources they need um, to, according to that particular circumstance um, I'm not sure I understand the specific teasing out of that particular environment private school that sounds like a private school that serves low income yes um, yeah I mean the the, the uh, I think the expectation is that schools that you know charge tuition um, should uh, include in their business model testing resources, um, and, uh, and 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 but there, you know, to that point, the the waiver application process, we are we are going to um, prioritize those schools that have demonstrable commitment to low income communities in the in the makeup of their their students. If, Megan, I think this is from an equity I'm lens. Here. We'll look to see what public health resource, resources can be brought to bear. Um, and it, it's gonna be on a case, these are the challenging case by case um, scenarios where we're actually looking at how much supply and testing and resources that we have. Are there ongoing outbreaks in other settings that we need to target that? And that's just the, um, the challenge in a pandemic of resource allocation and prioritization of those resources. But we are fully committed to ensuring, especially for children in Marin who come from low income communities and communities of color that they have um, equal access uh, to a supportive in, in classroom learning environment. That's, that's how we will get over the gap that we've already widened with educational attainment. So it's gonna be a case by case scenario based on changing resources and we look forward to thinking outside of the box. And again, this is where I see you as partners. Where, where are there additional resources in your support community to support all of us um, returning to in classroom education and so it's I think we have to think outside of the box and think as a village and can those kids those kids in lower income communities I mean a lot of our testing resources as we've said have been focused um, in, in communities where the people don't have insurance or need public health support right. and so in some ways um, you know any barriers to testing for the, the students themselves if they're coming from those you know there's we've already been trying to solve that problem and do have additional resources um, at the community level and also, we'll, we have more information. Um, we have a new data management system. We'll, we'll have information about many students who are from those communities if they've previously tested positive. Fortunately, it's not many high numbers. It's, it's still less than, I think, 400 kids under the age of 18. So, um, but we'll have, we do have information that we can help inform our schools as they go back online as well. Because we don't want to repeat testing in someone that's already tested positive as well. So there's some nuance in our public health approach too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, Matt, this question just came up again. Can I restate it? The question is, do teachers need, and I will say, when I say teachers, 
um, let's say school staff who will have contact with students. And there could be a variety of those at a school site, and those many that do not have the title teacher. Um, do they need to be tested before school starts? I believe what the frame is this. We want everyone, we are encouraging everyone to get us the baseline information and go through testing. And we will be providing information and accessing resources in order to do that, right? So that will be one. However, so that's the answer is no, they don't have to because we cannot make them uh, be tested. However, in the event that there is a positive scenario in their school and an exposure, that would be in fact a requirement and a staff member who refuses would essentially not be permitted to be at the school site during whatever the uh, quarantine. During an period. interval, yes. During an interval that would correspond to their period of infectivity if they had been infected. And, that, and that's different than the surveillance requirement. So yeah. there's a baseline testing concept and then there's surveillance testing concept. And we, again, with re some schools may have the ability to do baseline testing on all school staff and then go into surveillance and some may not and will just launch with their surveillance testing. And so it'll, it'll depend on resources. And again, I just wanna use this as an opportunity is getting tested is um, what we see is some people use a, a test positive or negative to decrease their vigilance and not engage in the personal protective behaviors that are going to keep co keep a COVID free environment in their home. So getting a negative test does not mean go out and play. We still are very much just like with our, I think of our professional basketball players and, and I see our school staff have to start thinking of themselves as the professional, professional sports players where we're making a commitment to isolate, really reducing our social activity so we can create cocoons for our families and for our school settings as we return. So um, testing is one mechanism, but our own protective behaviors are what's gonna keep COVID out of our communities. And again, there's gonna be school staff that do live in, in crowded housing situations. They may be lower income and don't have the same opportunities and so may have higher risk of, of being affected. But all of us have the, many of us who do, who, who do have the privilege of not living in crowded housing or not having um, the need to have um, driven by our wages to have multiple jobs, et cetera, need to think small and to keep our, our cocoons protected and to maintain our, the guidance from public health around our social bubbles and our um, social activity and, and, and minimizing that. There's so much we can control as we move forward if we stay vigilant. Mm -hmm. So can we have about seven minutes left? So can you, um try to prioritize. Hey, John Carroll, let me let you speak. What, what's your question? Yeah, he's, I think you're muted, John. So sorry. Um, so I, I have a K-8 school. And I'm wondering if it's a foregone conclusion that we will not be granted a waiver or if it's a possibility to request a waiver for TK through six. We have a self-contained seven, eight. Absolutely, yeah. I, um, thank you for an opportunity to clarify that. That yes, we are um, obviously the seventh, you know, categorically seventh and eighth grade students are not returning in classroom learning in, in monitored counties, but um, but sixth graders can. So yeah, the, the submit an application for whatever grades correspond to your, your environment, as long as, you know, be, be from K to six. Great, thank you. Next question regards current guidance says students can come to school during distance learning while on the monitoring list in small groups or individually for orientation type practices. What is a small group? Is it, and that's that's for the question around um, who can come in during the during yes. the orientation. Right. We haven't defined small group um, numerically. I'm going to say you know four kids. Um, you know four to six is a small group. You know it's it's, it's shy of the um, you know the full the full cohort. In, but um, we, you know, we, we, we think it's important that that kids who are going to start the school year in a distance learning mode at least have a an experience of a of a, of a physical of a relationship where there's been some actual contact with 
that environment, school environment. Um, so they have a so they have a mental model of what school is for them, um, where they can place themselves when they're distance learning virtually, um, and also a relationship with their instructor, with their teacher, which you think is such an important piece of this. So um, we don't want to create barriers to to that you know that moment, that time together um, on site, um, but we also don't want to create mixing um, that would occur if we, were, if we had too too large numbers doing that. So is that I hope that. Does that comply, Mary Jane and Ken, with your understanding of what that would look like? Mm -hmm. I think the number we've been using was less than the 12 cohort. Was 12. Okay. Yeah, I'm okay with that. If we wanted to say, you know, just keep with up to, up to you know, small groups, up to 12, that's the, that's the established number that we've used for daycare, um, et cetera. But, you know, importantly, and this is, you know, an opportunity to remind everyone that everything we're talking about, there's a safe way to do it and a not so safe way to do it. Um, and the safe way to do that would be for those kids to be together, you know, socially distanced, um, covering their faces. Um, and we know that that's a much, you know, that's what the expectation should, it should at this point go without saying that when we allow that, we're, we're assuming all the other standards are in place. Mm -hmm. and, and Matt, you're fine with more than one cohort at a school using all of those rules on the same day i.e. multiple classrooms. Yeah, not as, long as, they're not, as long as they're not mixing. Right. There are a number of folks on this call that are also running um, outdoor school programs or after school camp programs or camps this summer under all of the guidelines and they're wondering how those can be continued into the fall. We're updating those guidelines. So we are taking the new updated youth activity guidelines and we'll be reconciling the child care in camps guidelines with the new guidance. So we've seen a draft today, it's not ready to be published, but that will be um, updated, either released by the end of this week or early next week, that updated guidance. And, and, and I wanna be clear that the summer camps, um, you know, are, are intact. Um, that, that model is not threatened um, by, the, by the more recent guidance from the state. But, but we will have to reconcile for post summer camp childcare and camps um, into the school year. We're going to have to do some work to reconcile that with what the state is requiring. Mm -hmm. um, Matt, there's a question here about are the transportation guidelines ready? And just for you to know that we are, um, we have a meeting a couple of hours in person, appropriately masked with Dr. Willis this Friday, tomorrow, and we'll be reviewing some of the areas that we have not yet gotten to. I, we, we have some drafts, but not finalized. They include transportation and they, all, and they also include uh, substitutes, et cetera. So, we're um, hoping that, you know, by, as Dr. Willis said, for sure by the end of next week, but we're trying to make sure everything is um, available to you sooner than later. And, and yeah, and that's also true for, for the sports programs. Yes, yes. Do the, mm -hmm. do the testing requirements up for school staff apply to staff that are not in contact with students? Yes. Um, you know, obviously we prioritize, you know, the, 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 it's even a higher standard or higher expectation, but um, yes, because staff are, are relating to other staff. Adults are, are uh, infecting other adults and we see that. Um, and so the, if, there's a, if there's a public health recommendation that, um, you know, there's, there's sufficient activity on a campus where we're recommending staff be tested, generally applies to all staff. But it's a case by case basis. I'm not, you know, making a decision that we really, you know, this is one of the, we have public health nurses that have, uh, this is a form of consultation as well. We have public health nurses that, you know, that would speak with your staff um, to walk through the situation um, and describe the environment, describe what the nature of the exposure was and make a decision about who, who, who needs to be tested. During the orientation period, can several small groups be brought to a school site at the same time as long as social distancing, masking, and all other protocols are followed? I think we just, do we just answer that? Yeah. Yeah, yes. Okay, got it. Okay, Ken. That this sums is, them up. It's, it's, it does it, there's a, okay, last question. So um, thank you everybody for the time, it's 3.30. Uh, we, 
um, appreciate so much. We know what a challenge this uh, time frame has been. I think, you know, for all of us, we appreciate your sticking with it, leaning in, trying to figure out whether or not a waiver is appropriate uh, for you and your school and your school community. Um, and to Dr. Willis and to Dr. Santora, we so appreciate uh, the gift of your time uh, your willingness to dialogue with all of us. Uh, we look forward Wednesday, next Wednesday, uh, call 9 a.m., um, both Dr. Willis and Dr. Santora, and we're hoping to have uh, the final information for you um, related to the 30-point plan, transportation, sports, substitutes, uh, the waiver. So we're working hard to try to get a closure as soon as we can. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, take good care. Be safe. Wear your face covering. Bye-bye. Thanks.